The flood account of Genesis is considered by many to be a huge triumph for the documentary hypothesis. This is the view that there used to be different stories of Israel's history, until a redactor combined them into the form of the Pentateuch. Allegedly, there were two separate flood accounts that the redactor combined into one. Scholars today believe they are able to separate the two strands that were stitched together in Genesis, because the current text has doublets and repetitions. If we split up the current text of Genesis 6-9 based on its doublet nature, two independent flood stories emerge. Herman Gunkel called it a masterpiece of modern criticism. John Skinner wrote the resolution of the compound narrative into its constituent elements in the flood narrative is justly reckoned amongst the most brilliant achievements of purely literary criticism. But were there really two independent flood accounts that were combined into one? Or is it an attempt to force our literary standards onto an ancient culture and not read the flood narrative in light of its ancient Near Eastern context? For many decades, source critics have been convinced that there are two flood accounts in Genesis interwoven. One belongs to the J source and one belongs to the P source, which are hypothesized to be two of the sources that were combined to form the Pentateuch. The reasoning behind this hypothesis stems from how the flood account reads. The account seems to switch back and forth from calling God Yahweh and Elohim. In one section, God tells Noah to bring two every kind of animal into the ark. In another section, God says bring seven pairs of clean animals and birds. Noah seems to enter the ark twice. The flood is said to last for 40 days and 150 days. Because of these issues, and that there appears to be numerous repetitions, source critics suggest the most likely solution is to divide up the text based on differences in doublets. When this is done, it appears two unique flood accounts emerge, which is considered to be a huge achievement for the documentary hypothesis. And many scholars are still convinced of this. Joel Baden wrote, The J flood story, which is, when disentangled from that of P, perfectly complete and coherent. But a few decades ago, Gordon Wenham critiqued the idea Genesis contains two separate flood accounts that were stitched together. Recently, the scholar Joshua Berman defended Wenham's hypothesis and expanded on it, arguing that dividing up the flood account results in too many problems. And the account as it is may be a unified and original narrative within its ancient cultural context. One reason used to support the idea the flood account should be divided up is that it contains repetitions. Take Genesis 7, 21 and 22. It is repeated in the account that every living thing outside the ark had perished. These two verses are divided up between J and P, thereby removing what modern critics see as unnecessary repetition. But what we may find as unnecessary repetition may be placing our own literary standards onto an ancient text. Repetitions often do exist in ancient texts, especially for cultures that are steeped in oral traditions. Isaac Leo Seligman noted repetitions often can be literary devices within a text or oral performance. However, when source critics claim the doublets or repetitions of the flood account are best explained by positing different sources, they are setting up a double standard, because unnecessary repetitions result in both the hypothesized P and J account. In J, we read this, And there was rain on the earth forty days and forty nights, and Yahweh shut him in. And the flood was on the earth for forty days, and the waters multiplied and raised the ark, and it was lifted from the earth, and the waters grew strong and multiplied very much on the earth, and the ark went on the face of the waters, and the waters had grown very strong on the earth, and they covered all the high mountains that are under all the skies. In Hypothesize J, we have a repetition of the water being on the earth for forty days. Berman says, The note in verse 17 that the deluge was forty days is glaringly superfluous following the exact same claim in the previous verse of the non-P version. Moreover, it is repeated that the waters multiplied and that the waters grew strong. If repetitions like this were a problem for the hypothesized sources, why are they a problem for the hypothesis the flood account as it is is an original work? In the P account, we also see repetition. In Genesis 6, 11, and 13 we read, And the earth was corrupted before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and here it was corrupted, because all flesh had corrupted its ways on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, because the earth is filled with violence because of them. 
and here I'm destroying them with the earth. In order to indicate the earth was filled with violence, only verse 11 or 12 would suffice. Better yet, one could have started with verse 13 and left verses 11 and 12 out of it altogether. Another unnecessary repetition happens later in P. We read, And you take some of every food that will be eaten and gather it to you, and it will be for you and for them for food. And Noah did it. According to everything that God commanded him, he did so. Of all the animals that were pure, and of the animals that were not pure, and of the birds and everything that creeps on the ground, they came by twos to Noah, to the ark, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. In the six hundred year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the seventeenth day of the month, on this day all the fountains of the great deep were split open, and the apertures of the skies were opened. But this same idea seems to repeat right after, because what follows is, they and all the wild animals by their kind, and all the domestic animals by their kind, and all the creeping animals that creep on the earth by their kind, and all the birds by their kind, all fowl, all winged things, and they came to Noah to the ark, by twos of all flesh in which was the breath of life. And those that came were male and female, some from all flesh came, as God had commanded him. So at the end of verse 9 it suggests the animals are supposed to be in the ark, and the waters begin to rise. So why does the entire sequence need to be repeated in Genesis 7, 11 to 16? Berman says, The bisection of the text clearly does not provide us with two accounts, each free of repetitions and incongruities. In fact, neither of the proposed reconstructed texts possesses that quality. Moreover, the repeated boarding of the ark in P is egregious and cannot be attributed to a slip of the scribal hand. Also troubling is we find what is classified as P language in J. Source critics have stated that the P flood account has God sending the flood to wipe out all he created, whereas the J account has God sending the flood to wipe out mankind. The rest of the animals would merely be collateral damage. However, verse 6-7 allegedly a J text reads, and Yahweh said, I'll wipe out the human whom I have created from the face of the earth, from human to animal to creeping thing, and to the bird of the skies, because I regret that I made them. The verse also seems to invoke the fifth and sixth day of Genesis 1, which is also said to be a P text. Genesis 7 2 also invokes the need for clean animals. The only other occurrence of this phrase is in a P text, Leviticus 20 25. Some source critics have addressed this issue by suggesting that this P language was added by a later redactor. But if one can simply posit a redactor every time there is an issue, then are we really letting the data inform us, or is the documentary hypothesis assumed to be already true, and all difficulties are explained away? Berman says, The damning evidence of so-called P terminology, square in the middle of a so-called non-P passage, is not allowed to undercut the hypothesis. Rather, it is quarantined under the guise of editorial interpolation and disallowed rhetorical and hortatory contact with the rest of the passage, lest it contaminate that source's hypothesized ideological purity and distinction from the peace source. Another issue is some aspects of the unified narrative make more sense as is, rather than divided up between sources. The J account is said to state, And seven days later the waters of the flood were on the earth, and there was rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights, and Yahweh shut him in. The reasoning for this is because source critics assign the last section of Genesis 7.16 to J, because it has the divine designator of Yahweh. But the way the construction of the proposed source reads suggests that Yahweh only shut them in after it had been raining for forty days and forty nights. Second, the ending of verse 16 seems to fit better with the prior wording. And they came to Noah to the ark, by twos of all flesh, and which was the breath of life. And those that came were male and female, some from all flesh came, as God had commanded him. The line, and Yahweh shut him in, seems to follow from this section, which was allegedly part of another source. It does not align as well when the verse is divided between sources. Additionally, we are told within the flood narrative, both sources are preserved in their entirety. This would be true for the hypothesized P source, but the J source seems to be missing two sections. First, it lacks any command for Noah to construct the ark. Verse 7 1 is signed to J. Has God commanding Noah to enter an ark, he has not instructed Noah to build. It also does not report that Noah exited the ark. It proceeds from Noah sending the dove out and then seeing the earth was dry to him offering sacrifices. So did the hypothesized redactor omit aspects of the J account? If he was free to do that, then how do we know he also didn't supplement 
and alter so much of the original sources that scholars today can still reconstruct them. As we noted in the prior video, scholars like David Carr and Yua Pakala have demonstrated that ancient scribes rarely preserve their sources in the text for later scholars to reconstruct. If there are still discernible sources in the flood account, it would be unique among ancient literature. And if that is the case, why could it not have been a unique original work? Supporting this idea is the fact that the text as it is matches the plot structure and features found in cognate literature, namely the flood account in the Epic of Gilgamesh. As we noted in another video, the flood account of Genesis does not show evidence of direct literary borrowing from Gilgamesh, and instead, they both likely have a common origin in Mesopotamia, instead of either having been written by copying the other. The reason for thinking this is due to similarities between the accounts, while lacking evidence of literary borrowing. But the flood account within the Gilgamesh epic is a unified narrative, and no evidence indicates it is multiple flood accounts that were stitched together. In Genesis 6-9, as a unified narrative, matches many structures and themes we find in the Gilgamesh epic. Some have tried to respond to this by noting only the J or P flood account matches the flood account in Gilgamesh, but this is demonstrably false. It is the Genesis flood account as is, which fits with the structure of the Gilgamesh flood account. In 1978, Gordon Wenham highlighted the common plot structures between Genesis 6 9 as it stands in its current form and the Gilgamesh flood account. There are a lot of important differences between the two accounts, but they share broad similarity suggesting a common origin. When the Genesis flood account is divided up between P and J, neither contain all the plot elements we find in Gilgamesh. J lacks the warning to Noah, the command to build a vessel, the final resting spot of the Ark, the disembarkment, and the blessing of the flood hero. P lacks a command for the hero to board the Ark, details of the closing of the Ark, the hero opening the window, the hero offering sacrifices, and a deity smelling the offering. The flood account mentions rain and that the fountains of the deep broke open. Source critics divide the two sources of water between J and P. But the Gilgamesh epic has two sources of water as well, mentioning rain and dikes that broke open. Source critics assign the releasing of the raven to P and the releasing of the dove to J. But the Gilgamesh flood narrative has the hero sending multiple birds out, first a dove, a swallow, and then a raven. Moreover, the order in Genesis fits with seafaring techniques for locating dry land. A raven would likely have been released first, because it can fly further and survive on carry-on. A dove being released second logically follows, as it cannot fly as far as a raven and would be able to indicate if dry land was closer. The IVP Bible background commentary says, The most sensible strategy is to release a raven first and then use other birds to determine the depth of the water and the likelihood of a place to land. The dove and the pigeon have a limited ability for sustained flight. Thus, navigators use them to determine the location of landing sites. As long as they return, no landing is in close range. So the flood account as it is, with many of its doublets, matches what we find in an ancient Near Eastern parallel. Gary Rensberg says, We are supposed to believe that the two separate authors wrote two separate accounts of Noah and the Flood, and that neither of them included all the elements found in the Gilgamesh epic, but that when the two were interwoven by a redactor, voila, the story paralleled the Gilgamesh Flood story point by point. Joshua Berman says, How is it then that there are six elements in the epic absent from hypothesized P, and which just happen to be present in hypothesized non-P? Also supporting the unity of the Flood account is how it parallels Genesis 1 to 3. H. A. J. Kruger has noted that Genesis 8 to 9 invokes phrases and tropes from the account of creation in Genesis 1, and is meant to be understood as a recreation of things destroyed by the Flood. In both accounts, divine winds push back the water, blocking up the waters in 8 2 parallel the separation of the waters in Genesis 1 6 to 8. The dry land appears, then is followed in both by vegetation. We see the creation of vegetation in Genesis 1, and in Genesis 8, the dove returns with an olive branch. Then the dove takes its place in the natural order, corresponding to the creation of birds in Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, we see the creation of land animals, while in Genesis 8, humans and animals exit the ark. Both are followed by the same command to be fruitful and multiply. Berman gives a full list of the parallels between Genesis 1 and Genesis 8. 
And if we build on this, we can note that Joshua John Van E argues the covenant given in Genesis 9 is a restatement of the covenant presented in Genesis 1, 27-30. Genesis 9 then is Noah in a garden, and he's called a man of the soil, which parallels the account of Adam in Genesis 2. Both are then corrupted by fruit, naked, have their senses affected, have a tempter in the story, with both tempter's offspring being cursed, and conclude with both having their nakedness covered. Genesis 8-9 parallels the plot structure of Genesis 1-3 quite nicely. But source critics break up both of these sections of Genesis into J and P. It's strange that on their hypothesis, when J and P are combined, they create this mirrored structure between Genesis 1-3 and Genesis 8-9. But additionally, the flood account also somehow manages to match the plot structures of the Gilgamesh flood account. Supporting this, Joshua Berman notes that Genesis 6.13 to 9.17 contains a chiastic structure based on matching antipodal stages in the plot, which begins with God's first words to Noah and concludes with his last words. The structure is not lexical, but is based on plot elements. The second half narrates elements of recreation all undone by elements in the first half. If the text is broken up between sources, this structure is no longer retained. F.I. Anderson also notes the repetition in the flood account is not necessarily evidence of different sources, but likely stems from the author's use of epic repetition and chiastic coordination, which was often used within their cultural framework. Far from being a patchwork of two different accounts, the narrative composition looks as if it has been made out of whole cloth. We also see the flood narrative as it is places a strong emphasis on the number seven, and this helps support the unique chiastic pattern. Berman says, To this we may also add the observation that the pericope, as a whole, 6, 9 to 9, 17, is comprised of 77 verses, and that the midpoint of this section, the 39th verse, is the precise midpoint of the story conceptually, at 8, 1, and the Lord remembered Noah and all that was with him in the ark. What is clear here, however, is that if these data are indeed beyond random occurrences, then it is untenable to maintain that they are the accidental product of the interweaving of two independent strands, P and non-P. Additionally, God speaks to Noah seven times, flesh is mentioned 14 times, water 21 times, and Noah 28 times. Many of the repetitive verses may have been necessary to achieve these totals, and also add to the poetic nature of the account that function in the culture dominated by oral readings. Seven is a sacred number and is often used to symbolize completion and shows up through the early chapters of Genesis. In fact, the number shows up in the flood account exactly 10 times, another sacred number. And used with seven, we get the multiple of 70. Kenneth Matthews says, seven indicates that the animals and birds are considered a full complement, adequately representing the whole created order. Source critics have stated the different intervals for the flood may be indicators of different sources, since Genesis 7.17 says the flood was on the earth for 40 days, but verse 24 says 150 days. But the 40 days may simply be the first part of the 150 days of when the waters were growing stronger, because it also says the rain lasted the same length of time. But the numbers in the flood account may be for symbolic purposes, rather than specifying real lengths of time. Nahum Sarna notes the number 40 is often paired with a time of renewal, or atonement. In the flood account, the land must be renewed or atoned for, which makes sense the authors of the flood account would use a symbolic number that represents that theme. John Walton and Trepper Longman say, All of these are identifiable formulaic numbers that consistently carry rhetorical value. Whether the biblical text is interested in commenting on calendrical issues, as Qumran interpreters thought, the fact remains that the evidence from the ancient world in biblical usage indicates that we are not to read these time frames as specific or precise designations of actual time spans. We cannot reconstruct how long the rain lasted or the lengths of the aftermath of the flood from the information given. That sort of information is not given. Instead, it is designed to convey the massive scope of the cataclysm. Michael Lefebvre argues the flood account's dates were used for Israel's liturgical purposes not necessarily for specifying an exact chronology of the flood. Given this, 
The time spans of the flood account may not be indicators of a combination of different sources, but function for symbolic and liturgical purposes. One issue that is relied on heavily to support the division of the flood account of the J&P is the fact that in one section, God tells Noah to bring a pair of every animal onto the ark. But then in another section, God instructs Noah to bring seven pairs of clean animals and seven pairs of birds. However, this can be addressed by noting the latter instruction regarding the seven pairs can function as additional instructions in preparation for the need to sacrifice after the flood. Abraham Kuruvilla says, The seven pairs called for in 7.2-3 do not contradict 6.19, where pairs of every kind are called for. In the former, seven pairs, literary seven sevens, of clean animals are specified obviously in addition to the other set, and presumably for the purposes of sacrifice. Kenneth Kitchen said, The supposed class between Genesis 6.19.20 and Genesis 7.2.3 over two by two or seven pairs is imaginary. In Genesis 6.20, pair is probably being used as a collective for pairs, seeing that one cannot form a plural of a dual word in Hebrew. Genesis 6.19.20 and 7.8.9 are general statements, while Genesis 7.2.3, clearly twos and sevens, is specific. This is really only a contradiction if we're being uncharitable with the text. In reality, the text functions fine with God noting to bring two of every animal onto the ark, then adding additional instructions regarding clean animals and birds. Therefore, when we dive into the details of the flood account and study it in its biblical context and ancient Near Eastern context, the hypothesis that it was originally two separate sources does not stand up to scrutiny. It makes far more sense to see it as a literary unity written in a culture that utilized doublets, multiple divine designators, and repetitions. There is no reason to think the text contains two different flood accounts that were stitched together, and the data suggests it was likely an original work as it is.